Good afternoon. This is the Thurston County Board of Health, uh, August 8, 2017. I'm Commissioner Bud Blake, Chair of the Board of Health this year. Uh, I'd like to start off by doing introductions. And to my left is Commissioner Gary, uh, Gary Edwards. To my right is John Hutchings, Commissioner John Hutchings. And to his right is Lydia Hodgkinson, the Crooker of the Board. To her right is Shelly Slaughter, uh, Director of Public Health and Social Services. And to her right is Dr. Wood, uh, the Health Officer for Lewis and Thurston County. And to her right is the Assistant County Manager, Romero Chavez. And with that in mind, I'll call the meeting to order, and I'll ask if there's an approval for today's agenda. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the agenda uh, for the BOH of Tuesday, August 8, 2017. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the agenda for August 8, 2017. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that motion carries. And so for the minutes for meeting minutes for June 13, 2017. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the uh, meeting minutes from June 13, 2017 uh, with a change. Okay, with the change, what is the change? The, uh, it shows in attendance John Hutchings, but then subsequently it says uh, Hutchins. Oh, oh yeah. is a spelling? Yeah, just a spelling, it's okay. no biggie. We'll accept that, we accept that spelling. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, with the change, is there a motion to approve the minutes for June 13, 2017? As amended. As amended, yes. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the minute meetings for June 13, 2017 as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Aye, and that motion carries. So the next item we have on the agenda is the opportunity for the public to address the health board. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to come forward from the public to address the board? Seeing no one, we'll go forward to the next item, which is our departmental items and um, with that is number three Thurston Thrives update we have Liz Davis who's going to do an introduction and tell us a little bit about Camp Hope and probably turn it over to Trish yes yeah um, Commissioner, thank you for having me here uh, each month to tell you a little bit about what's going on with Thurston Thrives I'm thrilled today uh, that Trish Gregory executive director of the Family Support Center is here to tell you about Camp Hope Hope is a very hot topic in our county right now. I'm sure that you've been hearing a lot about it. In 2013, John Thunheim, our Thurston County prosecuting attorney, and our public health director, Shelley Slaughter, when she was at the time executive director of the Family Support Center, started talking with Dr. Chan Hellman, who is a professor at the University of Oklahoma at Tulsa, and he is one of the preeminent hope researchers in the world. And Dr. Hellman has figured out not only how um, hope impacts children and adults in life, including things like uh, being a great predictor of graduation rates, but also the three things that make up hope and also how it can be measured. So I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more, but um, in 2015, John and Shelley convened a committee with uh, staff from the prosecutor's office, Family Support Center, um, together, and also Thurston Thrives. And we worked together to put on a community event called Three Days of Hope, which included seminars by Dr. Hellman for community leaders, organizational leaders, people who um, work with um, populations who um, are in need of hope and work with them every day on the front lines for business people and then culminated in an event for people who are working um, to end substance abuse and also alcoholism in our community. And so that was a great event and since then those same partners and more have been convening regularly to launch a community hope um, sort of not only awareness campaign, but also community, health, community hope promotion campaign in Thurston County. We are currently in the process of writing some grants to provide for the initial planning phase and are hoping that in, hoping <laughs> <laughs> that within five years, we're gonna have something amazing up and running that's not only measuring the hope in our county collectively, but is also working to improve hope among children, adults, and families. And Camp Hope is one of the most exciting things that I think is uh, going on 
this month, actually, this week in our county. And so I'll uh, turn it over to Trish to tell you more about this phenomenal program. Yay. Thank you. Hello, Trish. How are you doing there? Hi. Can you bring the microphone down just a little bit? Sure. There you go. Now right. I can hear you. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I've been with the Family Support Center for about 16, 17 years of lost track. Um, but this is one of the most exciting opportunities that we've had since I've been there to really come up with a program or to build a program that um, supports children um, and their families in a really concrete way. So we're very excited about Camp Hope and excited to get moving forward. So as Liz said, I'm Trish Gregory, Executive Director of Family Support Center. And to start, um, since we're just getting ready for our very first Camp Hope, we haven't had the opportunity to have our own success stories yet or to have our own counselors participating in the process. But um, since we have our affiliate, Camp Hope America, we've borrowed some materials from them so I could share with you the story of Tara. camp it basically is a week where kids who have been subjected or victimized in some sort of way or have experienced trauma can get away for a week from everything and just learn about how to overcome and cope with the things that happen from experiencing these traumas and just a week for them to have fun and get to do things that they wouldn't be able to do without the camp. I've experienced different types of abuse and traumas throughout my childhood, and I wish that I would have had something like this. I think that if I had had a camp like this, um, going into high school, I probably would have made um, some different choices with the people who I chose to be friends with, because I would have thought that I deserved better friends. And then also with intimate relationships, I would probably have chosen more healthy ones. Yeah. So there's five great, amazing girls, and since we started, uh, well, since we met, it's really just been a connection. We started bonding over gymnastics and doing cartwheels and splits the first five minutes we knew each other, no boundaries. I hope I can have an extremely positive impact on their life. I hope that I can show them that it does get better and you can move on and become great things. I come from a family where my dad's just not around and he was in and out of jail, but I want to become a doctor, a doctor of psychology. I want to further my education and I want to just be successful and I'm not letting what happened in the past affect that. I think that Camp Hope so far has changed my life by kind of putting things into perspective for me. I mean, it's really easy to sit there and feel bad and angry about the things that have happened to you. But when you come here and you realize that there's all these people who also have gone through the same things, maybe even what you claim to be worse, because you know it's all relative. Um, but they're still here having fun, opening up. To me, hope is the possibility to do and feel however you want every single day, no matter what happened yesterday. And like I mentioned, we borrowed that one from Camp Hope America. So the donate to Camp Hope America should be replaced with donate to the Family Support Center of South Sound for our local families with children. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier in the, uh, before the video, Tara is a camp counselor that served in California. And I wanted to give just a real brief history of how the camp came about um, and where it originated. So the first Camp Hope um, was in 2002 at Lake Sutherland, California, um, followed by shortly after um, Camp Hope became a larger collaborative project of multiple family justice centers in California and became Camp Hope, California. 
Shortly after that, about three years later in 2015, the Verizon Foundation invested a large chunk of money to help to bring that across the nation. And the Family Support Center was one of those recipients of a grant for $10,000 to begin implementation of the program. So our Camp Hope Washington will take place at Panhandle Lake in Shelton, Washington. Uh, we have two weeks of camp. The first week will be for the older kids, and the second week will be for a younger group of kids. So the older kids are 12 to 17, and younger are 7 to 11. There's lots of different activities that take place at camp. Some of them are listed up here. We have an on-site challenge course that provides an opportunity to do things like uh, balancing on wires while in between trees, utilizing your friends and your partners to figure out complex um, different activities and really a lot of problem solving and group work. Um, there's swimming and canoeing on the lakefront at Panhandle. A day trip to Nature Nurture's farm and the White Salmon River. So the White Salmon River, they'll get to do some white water river rafting, so we're very excited about that. Mm. Um, Assistance Dogs of the Northwest is bringing us six puppies. And so um, the, the facilities at Panhandle have um, a 4-H camp set up, so we have a large arena where kids will get to run with puppies, so we're excited about that as well. Um, there'll be craft activities, the HOPE curriculum, and in addition, there'll be field games. But Camp Hope is so much more than just your typical summer camp. Camp Hope is an evidence-based camp and it's peer-reviewed. The program is specifically designed to build hope and resiliency in kids, um, and specifically those that have, have experienced trauma like Tara spoke about in her intro. What makes Camp Hope unique um, or how we measure hope, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, we utilized Chan Hellman's um, Hope Index, and actually it was Sid Snyder was the originer, uh, originator of that, and then um, Chan Hellman brought that to our attention and to our community as Liz was sharing earlier. So the Hope Index, it's been a really interesting piece for us to utilize with kids. Um, it includes a lot of questions on there about where kids are, socially, how they are connecting with their peers, and what their um, overall experience has been. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the answers to those questions have been both very exciting and very disheartening. We're also utilizing camp, camp counselor evaluation, so they'll have some anecdotal um, measurements to show if we're increasing hope in kids or not. So the Camp Hope curriculum um, is specifically designed to build the characteristics and traits that are positive and that promote resiliency and hope. So this gentleman, Louis Zamberini, are any of you aware of, of him and his experience? Oh, with the Olympian, Olympics? Mm-hmm. Good. Um, the Olympics as well as um, he, I have to get my notes up to date, sorry about that. Um, a World War II survivor, and during the war, his plane went down on a search and rescue mission, and he was stranded at sea for 47 days. And when he finally got to land, he was um, taken by Japanese soldiers who then took him to the camps there and was tortured for many years before finally coming home to his family. So his story is one of great sadness and lots of challenges, but also of resiliency and hope. And part of the curriculum will be focusing on him and his experiences. So the kids have the opportunity to, with their counselors, they will hear the story of Louis Zamberini, and then they'll debrief on that and talk about the activities that they're doing at camp and how those are comparable and how they can turn challenges in their lives into avenues of hope and moving forward. Campfire is another important, unique um, component of Camp Hope. It's one of the essential elements where all the campers, the staff, the volunteers come together to debrief and talk about the experiences of the day. Each day they'll ask the question of where did you see hope today? And the students or the children will have the opportunity to talk about each other and to each other about their experience supporting the things that they have learned throughout the day. 
All of the activities and one of the primary components that make this camp special um, are the challenge by choice. So there's very purposeful um, activities that boost the adrenaline and get kids to move beyond where they're comfortable in three stages. One is they can stay in their comfort zone, um, move to their challenge zone, or to that panic zone. And so the difference being we want to push kids to try things that might be a little bit scary, like river rafting or um, participating in a challenge course that's high up off the air. Um, but we don't want to push them so far that they go into panic mode. But the idea behind it is we're giving them the opportunity to set goals for themselves that are challenging and then accomplish those goals, which then builds their hope and builds their resiliency and their internal uh, belief that they can do things. There's a large emphasis on character traits within Camp Hope rather than praising kids for what, they're, what they can do or what they're like or that, hey, you're an awesome kid or I really like you. It's focusing in and really trying to identify the special things about each child, looking at um, persistence, integrity, um, and those traits that we want them to develop to become um, successful adults. So throughout camp, the camp counselors are awarding these character trait awards <coughs> being very purposeful and mindful of each individual child and identifying one that really meets that child's characteristics. So each one will go home with one of these character trait awards and um, you know, quite honestly, sometimes it takes longer to find a positive trait for some of these kids that are really challenging and really press um, behavior issues and things. But every child has positive character traits and it, once you unbury those and honor those and acknowledge those with the kids, it helps them to keep moving forward and realize that they have value and that they do have a place um, at this camp. Hook activities are used, um, 15 to 20 minute team building exercises that are done each day. They're all developed around the theme of the day. So when we're talking about um, Zamborelli and looking at the idea of forgiveness, then the activities for that day will be built around that character trait. So we're really taking all of the components um, and making sure that the kids have opportunities to hear the positive things that are going on and to connect those things with the stories of resiliency and hope. Oops, I skipped over one, sorry about that. Trauma-informed care. Um, it's so a treatment framework to recognize, understand, and respond to the effects of um, trauma and the lives of survivors. We train all of our counselors on that extensively, as well as training on ACEs and multiple other components of how to help kids that have experienced trauma. Um, and all of that is a, in a result to help these counselors to develop trusting relationships with the kids. Um, many of these kids have been through extremely challenging things and they may have challenges with building trust with somebody else. So we provide some additional training and support for the counselors so that they can break through that barrier if that exists and help them to, um, to have a, a really fun time at camp and make a, a social connection. Many of our counselors have experienced and overcome trauma in their lives as well so they have the empathy of understanding where these kids are coming from. And we know that it takes 11 negatives to un, or excuse me, 11 positives yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to undo one negative. Um, and we have our work cut out for us. Um, these kids have seen and heard the worst things in the world. And the average ACE score for these kids that are entering into Camp Hope is five and a half. The CDC recognizes that only 12.5% um, of youth that were interviewed and done, did the ACE score through that program um, only 12.5% per uh, excuse me, of them scored four or higher. And so our kids are significantly starting out with a higher ACE score. And these are kids that have um, observed a parent committing suicide, have seen a mom who was being strangled, have experienced trauma themselves through child abuse and neglect. Um, so there's a lot of negatives that they've ex experienced. So making this camp time a really intensively positive and meaningful experience and helping them to build connections and to understand that it's not the same everywhere in the world and you can move forward, you can change, and hopefully we can break the cycle. Time for questions. Okay. And do you have any questions? My favorite time. <laughs> yeah, Gary's about to come over to I hope to tell you, got questions. Uh, 
Gary wants to be first. That's fine. Do you know how <laughs> they came up with the age split of, uh, I think it sounds like it's 12, at, at 12 to 17? It, it seems to me, I, I think of a 12 year old lining up more with the nine year old than the 17 year old. So, so what we know about child development about. is every child develops a little bit differently. So our framework for the ages is, is not a solid set. Um, so we might have an 11 year old that's very mature and that is more suited to be with the older group and we'll place them with the okay, older group. So it's not locked in. Yeah, it's not completely locked in, but those frames um, were what were provided by the original founder of the camp, and we found them to be fairly accurate with as far as the ability for kids to connect with the other kids um, and to have kind of shared experience and shared, shared development. And you just mentioned, maybe I didn't even pick up on it completely, forgiveness, was that the fellow that had been shot down? And Yes, that was one of the components. He's also a... Um, a Olympic athlete, and so there's persistence and some other characteristics too that he's displayed, but forgiveness is the one that he himself um, puts forth as his gift to the world is to teach about forgiveness. Um, and at one point he even went back to the uh, primary person that was his abuser and, and asked that, wanted to ask that person for forgiveness, but they wouldn't allow him is to. Is that the fellow they made the movie out of? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay, good enough. Yeah. Yep. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. What else you got? Well, no, I don't hog the show. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hog it. Yeah, you can hog it. Ms. Gregory, do you prefer Patricia, Patricia, or what do you go by? I only go by Patricia when I'm in trouble or at the doctor's office. Go. So I go by Trish. <laughs> by Trish, okay. Yes. Um, you almost said it backwards, uh, you know, taking 11 positives to undo one negative, but the opposite would be true because one negative can wipe out a, a dozen positives. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, right. I love the fact that this uh, uh, is evidence-based and peer-reviewed, uh, but a couple questions regarding the camp coming up. Is it enrollment full, or how does somebody go about enrolling? We are almost full. We have slots for an additional four children in the older age group for boys and for girls. Uh, we have a waiting list for the younger groups, and we, have, we know that we have some additional referrals coming in um, through a couple of our partners that will fill those slots. But if you know of someone who would be interested in going and is um, a little bit away from the trauma that they've experienced, we want kids that um, feel stable and feel safe um, but are ready to kind of move forward. Um, but we definitely will accept additional referrals, and we want to have a waiting list of at least five for each age group so that if for some reason someone can't go, we can fill those slots. So there's no specific deadline, just one that's full. It's full? Okay. Yep. And then how do you screen the participants? Is it based on the ACES score? Yeah, that's exactly what That I was my question. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we'll accept children with any ACE score. But right. the camp is for kids who have experienced uh, trauma through domestic violence, sexual assault, or child abuse. Um, and so what we're screening for is basically, will they be able to be safe while they're at camp? Um, are they safe for other people while they're at camp? Are they emotionally safe to be away from their parents? Um, so it's really more about um, typical things that you would screen for in a camp to make sure that kids would be safe while they're there. Um, there's, we didn't have any kids that screened out of our camp. We actually screen in if there's kids that are having some pretty significant mm -hmm. behavior challenges. We'll still screen those in. They just get assigned to me <laughs> and or someone else with um, a strong background in, in helping children manage their behavior. And you prefer them away from, some time away from their trauma, but not currently experiencing it or currently in it. Yes. Okay. Uh, two more and I'm done. Once the camp is over, is there follow-up done with the, uh, the participants? Yes, thank to you for asking that. see how they're doing, that. if they've reactivated something or triggered trauma again? Yes, thank you for asking that. So, You're welcome. Um, <laughs> that's something I forgot in my presentation. <laughs> um, so... Part of the beauty of camp is these kids have an opportunity to develop some real connections with their mentors and with their peers that are at camp. So we will be having a minimum quarterly activities for the kids to get together with their counselors and that was one of the requirements of volunteering is that they would continue a relationship. Um, because we don't wanna just have this great euphoric activity mm -hmm. and then boom, they're on their own and back in their, um, in their old life that they before camp were at. Um, so we do have that kind of follow-up, and the kids will have ongoing opportunities to engage with their peers and with their mentors. 
Um, as far as counseling and follow-up, if there's traumas or triggers, we do that on an individual basis. Um, CAMP is not um, a counseling program. It's really intended to be a hope-building program, um, but it's not, a, um, it doesn't take the place of counseling. Okay. And finally, thanks for letting me hog, it, hog this for a bit. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. This is good research, based on good research, and research begets further research. What can we expect to come next? What's on the horizon with this Camp Hope or the uh, study of hope? Um, as far as Camp Hope goes, our goal is to continue expanding this. And right now, um, the Family Support Center's Family Justice Center program was the second family justice center in the state, and it's all family justice centers that are implementing Camp Hope across the nation. Um, and our goal is, as we see additional family justice centers emerge throughout Washington, which there are others, um, now Spokane is in process, um, and there's other places that will also be identifying additional um, family justice centers. So our goal is that it becomes a state initiative and that it's something that uh, we've started here in little old Olympia um, and can spread so that kids across Washington State have access. And currently we'll accept kids from anywhere so long as they can get to us in order to get to camp. Um, but we'd like to see that expanded so that there's opportunities on both sides of the mountains and additional children served. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Gary wants back in. <laughs> Are, are you uh, coordinating with like boys and girls clubs, big brother, big sister, that type of thing for potential participants? Yes, we have a wide array of partners that we have requested to um, send in nominees for um, the campers. Many of them came from our own Family Justice Center program, but we had referrals that came through the Thurston County Prosecutor's Office, through Safe Place, through... Um, the Boys and Girls Club through local doctor's offices, and we reached out to all of our partners that serve families with children, specifically those affected by domestic violence, and asked for referrals for the program. This kind of goes back to my thing about 30% of the oh, population yeah. and 100% of our future. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Spot on. Trish, oh, you got another one? You back in? Or no, I'm You're done. Good. Trish, uh, tell us, you said this is a, a Camp Hope, uh, how many um, are throughout the nation and how many here in Washington State, so you can brag about how many? Mm -hmm. We're the only one in Washington That's State. Right. Mm -hmm. The Verizon Foundation worked uh, with the Alliance for Hope and Camp Hope America to initiate, um, I think the goal is 20 by 2020, maybe 22 by 2020. Mm -hmm. So currently most are located in California. That's the largest amount of family justice centers in the nation. Um, but it's quickly spreading. Um, when we received our uh, grant from Verizon to implement the program, there were five other agencies that received it at that time. And then this year in 2016, additional agencies received that same support from Verizon to start their programs as well. So we should be up to 22 by 2020 with the goal of there being a Camp Hope in every state within the nation. Okay, great. And I heard you talk about the, the children, the kids here from 7 to 17, but uh, what's the total number of kids? And I know you're almost full and you can accept a few more, but what's the total number you think you're going to wind up with? In terms of Our goal is to have 60 children, 30 in each age group. Okay, great. And then so um, I want to ramble for a second. So uh, to talk about the counselors, I guess. You did say it's not a camp for counseling per se, but I see here the activities are more action-oriented in terms of instead of, say, clinical, some guy walking around with a white suit on, the stethoscope and all that kind of <laughs> stuff, but, but action-oriented. But uh, brag about how the counselors really are the uh, front line of success for this and how you had to bring people on board to make this uh, a worthwhile effort. So. Yes. Uh -huh. So um, I had the opportunity of sitting in and participating in the training for our counselors that started um, two days ago. Um, and it is an absolutely amazing experience. And next year, I'll be sure to we invite you down to. Uh oh. We'll, we'll give you an assignment. You can come present something. Okay, no for white us. jackets. Okay. <laughs> um, but the counselors are all youth that are aged 18 to 24 who have made a commitment to attend two full days of training um, on the topics that I talked about already, the trauma-informed care, ACEs, um, developing relationships with youth. Um, and they're kids that have committed their time. They're volunteering. There's no pay for the position. Um, but all of them that we have that are coming on right now are super excited. Um, 
One of the, the boys, Jared, said to me yesterday, he said, I don't know why I was so nervous. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> um, but what we've seen from the research done um, across the nation at the other camp hopes is the counselors gain as much as the, the campers do. And so it's really an opportunity for us um, as those campers get older and age out of camp, our goal is to incorporate them back in as those mentors for the youth that are coming into the program. Super. Any other questions, comments? I just think it's great that you're out there intervening. I think early intervention is the answer to almost everything we're faced with today. And yeah, yeah. I agree, I so that's question. why we're so excited about this program, and it is one of the first um, really true prevention programs focused on youth that we've done as an agency, so yeah. we're very excited about right. it. Is the Verizon Foundation that made this possible the same Verizon? Yes. Is it? Oh, My wonderful. Phone Verizon, yeah. Telephone, very good. Yeah. <laughs> very good, thank you, uh, thank you. <laughs> Shall you have a comment or a question? Yes, I just wanted to say, I think it is amazing to be the first one in the entire state of Washington and one of only a dozen or so selected in the entire country. I think Thurston County should be very proud. And I understand you were also featured live on King 5 News last week. So thank you so much for what you're doing for kids in our community. And I wanted to ask, is there anything you still need from the community that could support the camp? Volunteers, supplies, are there ways in which uh, the community can get involved in supporting and how to get in touch with you mm -hmm. yes Good so the question. primary need we have right now are two things we're we're still in need of funding for the program uh, we have the basics funded however the staffing for the program to maintain the program year-round we're still working on raising um, the other huge need that we have that's keeping us awake at night um, is we need two um, lifeguards for camp um, it'll be three days a week for the two weeks um, and we've posted that in multiple places. It's a paid position. But finding someone that wants to come for just a couple hours all the way to Shelton to be a lifeguard has proven to be very challenging. So if you know any swimmers, we actually can offer a certification course um, through the Sheriff's Department or one of our partners at the Sheriff's Department that teaches that class. Um, so if you know some youth that are, and they don't even have to be youth, it could be an adult as well um, for that role, but that's our greatest need right now. We're also still seeking donations of food items to help with reducing the costs of the food for camp, because that's a pretty significant cost as well. Hmm. Anything else? No. no. That's great. I just got to echo, we are so grateful for you and your staff there at Camp Hope for taking care of the kids here in Thurston County, Mason County, wherever they come from. It is absolutely admirable and just, uh, oh well, and what you do at Family Support Center with uh, moms and kids coming through your door. It's just wonderful to see what you do. So thank you so much, Trish. Thank you. You're bad. Thank you. All righty. So the next item we have on our agenda is... Back to school health, fitness, and nutrition safety with, are you going to do this, Chris, or are you going to tee it up? And I think we have Dr. Rachel Wood and uh, Leslie Price. Is that correct? You've got it. Okay, you got it. Take it away. PowerPoint. Presentation will be up in a second. Yeah. Great. Go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. My name is Chris Hawkins. I'm the Community Engagement, Evidence, and Partnerships Manager for Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. And uh, happy to be before you today in August to talk about back to school health and safety, or actually health, fitness, nutrition, and safety. Uh, we're proud to be able to be part of this today. Uh, Dr. Rachel Wood, our health officer, will come up and do part of this presentation, as will Leslie Price, our public health nutritionist. And I'll round it out with some discussion of our getting back to school safely efforts. Okay. So uh, to begin with, um, just wanted to give a little bit of an overview here. Uh, obviously, education is one of these key social factors in the health of our community. And the long-term health of our community depends on kids and families achieving more in education. And so that's been a main focus of Thurston Thrives. Uh, there is an education and resilience action team within Thurston Thrives, and uh, Camp Hope is actually one of those strategies that's being carried out as part of that team. They also have a focus on making sure that kids succeed in school uh, and do a variety of activities aimed at improving some of those measures in education, including the graduation rate, uh, reading levels, math uh, skills, et cetera. 
Uh, and so that's uh, an effort that continues in our community through the efforts of that action team. And we're going to cover some of the topics that, uh, that add into that readiness to go back to school uh, because we're approaching the start of the school year. Uh, one of the things that obviously the education resilience action team strategy is focused on is improving uh, kids' resiliency, their uh, ability to bounce back from adverse experiences. So reducing those ACEs is one of the key things that they aim for, but also trying to build up protective factors so that kids can bounce back. Uh, part of this also is obviously uh, teaching about and modeling some of those important skills in healthy relationships, um, communications, problem solving, um, being able to relate to others and empathize with others and having a connection to a uh, caring adult are all main factors in that. Uh, and so that's something that our community can contribute to, obviously, as we try to help kids become better prepared for school and ready to go back to school. Uh, and that takes a lot of effort across a variety of sectors here. Uh, with that, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Wood up here to cover some of the key back to school preparedness that people in our community can do. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Rachel Wood, the health <laughs> officer for both Lewis and Thurston counties. And as always, it's an honor to be here and a chance to talk with you and the community about keeping our, our children uh, in school healthy, ready to learn, and eager to be educated. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is um, injury prevention. Uh, it has to do with um, pre-participation sports physical, um, and also, you know, being aware that playground injuries can happen. Um, they happened to me long ago. Maybe that's, um, my husband would say, that's what happened. No. Um, but, um, no. uh, you know, <laughs> if you fall off the swing set and hit your head, uh, you need to be aware to tell somebody uh, uh, that you've done that. Um, concussion is not a good thing to have. Um, the th this uh, also ties in with the Thurston Thrives uh, Clinical Action Team. Um, they have uh, banded together with the Safety Net Council, and that's um, where uh, activities reside now for the clinical uh, care. Uh, so getting on with sports. Is the goal? Okay, excellent. Um, the goal is to maximize the health of the athlete. And it's a good idea, if possible, to get a physical uh, prior to beginning the sport, ideally at six weeks. Um, although you'll hear a little later from me in this very presentation that we have a sports physical pre-participation event happening this very evening at St. Peter's Family Practice uh, um, uh, over there on the St. Peter's Hospital campus. Um, and I'll tell you more about that. Um, when in the sports physicals, they will look for a history of health problems, they'll be checking blood pressure, um, seeing if asthma is controlled, and checking for musculoskeletal uh, problems. Uh, and the reason we like a little bit of time before they start with the sport is it's nice to do treatment or rehabilitation if you've got a musculoskeletal injury. Um, another aspect of health at school is with our teens, uh, at least 70% of um, mortality, so deaths in 10 to 24-year-olds in the United States involve unintentional injuries, suicide and homicide. And so for friends, family, coaches, teachers, uh, and even um, clinical care providers to be aware that um, these are the are some of the areas that teens um, are most at risk, it would be nice for people to be aware of these aspects uh, to talk about, you know, why they might be uh, led down the path to take a risky behavior or to uh, experience psychosocial stress. Um, I, I found this, I was happy to find it in um, contemporary pediatrics uh, it, uh, with a concern to keeping our young folks healthy. So uh, yet another area that we um, want our young folks to be uh, protected is to have immunizations on board so that they stay healthy and stay in school 
They don't have to be excluded from school because they're um, susceptible to an infectious disease that is vaccine preventable. Uh, and one way is obviously to go to your healthcare provider if you have one and get those uh, immunizations before school starts. If you don't, you can call within reach um, and they will be happy to uh, direct you to a place nearby where you can get immunizations. <coughs> but along these lines, these are the required immunizations. There are also recommended immunizations. There's a distinction. Um, and so these include hepatitis B, um, the combination of vaccines that include diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis or whooping cough, um, polio, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox. Um, and um, our Medical Reserve Corps is actually uh, providing several immunization clinics uh, over the next several weeks. One of them is tonight. The one tonight is just for uh, teenagers. Um, there are three vaccines that are, um, we recommend uh, and, and want our um, teenagers to have. And then there are other immunization clinics. One is at the Little Red Schoolhouse event on August 17th. Uh, another is at Tumwater School District Clinic on August 22nd. And uh, there's another at the Kaiser Permanente Clinic in September. And the reason we do that is if you need a couple of shots, the thing is over the years, some of these uh, immunizations require a series. And we want people, maybe if you come at August 17th or 22nd, you can have a second one of the same um, uh, type of immunization in September. And now I would like to uh, hand over the microphone to my uh, colleague, Leslie Price, who's going to talk about breakfast. Hello, Leslie. Hello. Talk about our favorite dinner, our yeah. lunch, or talk breakfast. About food. Yeah, food. All right, well, thank you, commissioners, for having me. My name is Leslie Price. I am a registered dietitian, and I am the public health nutritionist at uh, the public health um, department. And I am here to talk about breakfast, uh, specifically um, in kids going back to school and why that's important. In addition to obvious reasons for the health of children and nourishing their bodies, as far as school goes, the, the bottom line for kids to eat breakfast is they do better in school. They learn better, they're more attentive, they have better grades, uh, reduces tardiness, suspensions. Um, they're also less likely to be overweight than kids who regularly skip breakfast. So when the school list uh, supplies come out, um, hopefully they include daily breakfast on there. So in Thurston County, the uh, 2016 Healthy Years survey, Youth Survey, as you can see, uh, sixth graders do the best job eating breakfast, and as you can see, as kids get older, they tend to not eat breakfast as much as they did when they were younger, so I don't know where you all fit in on that scale, but uh, it is, no way. it's impro important for it adults as well. So. so what is a healthy breakfast? Um, well, I could be here for three hours talking about nutrition, but um, just to be quick, uh, a healthy breakfast, breakfast should include at least three of the food groups. Um, and you can see the My Plate up there. The My Plate is a visual uh, depiction of what a healthy diet should be. It's based on the USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture um, Dietary Guidelines. Uh, back in the day, you might have uh, seen the pyramid which confused the entire world. So now we are on a more simpler version of uh, a plate. Most people can recognize that. Uh, the my plate, you've probably heard this, fill your plate half with fruits and vegetables, focus on whole fruits, vary your vegetables, the other half uh, split with grains, preferably whole. You wanna make half your, half your grains whole. Uh, vary your protein, it doesn't have to be meat, um, lots of other things can give you protein, peanuts, peanut butter, legumes, um, you know, things like that. And then low fat dairy. So you wanna try to get at least three of those you for your breakfast. So, and breakfast doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be a three course meal that takes an hour. I've listed just some examples of some grab and go things, you know, 
toast with some peanut butter and milk, uh, maybe a, some crackers and cheese and some, some fruit. You can also, you know, have your spaghetti with the glass of milk that you had the night before or even oh some, God. you know, a piece of pizza on the way out the door. So it, it, it really doesn't have to be hard. Um, for those kids who don't really get a good breakfast at home, uh, most schools offer the USDA school breakfast program. Um, it's designed to, you know, provide nourishing meals to kids. And the school, for each meal they provide, they receive a subsidy from the USDA. They do have to meet federal requirements. They can't just, you know, throw Fruit Loops on the table and tell them to go for it. Um, they also have to offer free or reduced price breakfast to eligible children. And these are the requirements. I know it's hard to see, but basically they have to have three food groups. Um, there are limits on uh, calories in saturated fat and sodium. Uh, and it's, it, it changes. You know, there's grades K through 5 have a little bit different requirements than and six through eight and nine through 12. So, and some schools offer breakfast before school and some offer it um, after school starts. You've probably heard of breakfast after the bell. Um, obviously more kids end up eating it if it's after they get to school because a lot of parents can't get, to their, get their kids to school before it starts. Uh, breakfast is also a, a, a component of a, of a community campaign we did uh, with the Healthy Child Weight Coalition from 2010 to about 2015. The seven is eat breakfast seven days a week. The five is five servings of fruits and vegetables. Two is two hours or less of screen time. Um, and one is one hour of physical activity. Chris will be talking about that um, in a few minutes. And then zero sugary drinks on most days. The Healthy Child Weight Coalition was a group of organizations in Thurston County that worked with kids and were focused on health and activity and got together because we were seeing an increase um, in childhood obesity in Thurston County. We had you know, folks from the Parks Department. We had St. Peter's was at the table, uh, schools, um, just different folks from around the county. Um, if you know who Dr. Yu is, she was a previous health officer. She's the one who made that <coughs> banner in the bottom right-hand corner, and she still takes that out and does Zumba all over the place in the <laughs> summer. So you've probably seen that before. She's funny. Yeah. And uh, Liz was talking earlier about Thurston Thrives. The, uh, the food team of Thurston Thrives developed a strategy map that really breakfast hits pretty much everything. Uh, there are a couple objectives. Oh, I can't even see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. <laughs> and you have youth on your side. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the objectives, increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables and increasing volume of healthy food to schools, institutions, and food banks. Obviously, breakfast can help meet those objectives. Um, which lead to the goals of kids and families at healthy weight and food widely available to everyone, which in turn uh, meets the, the total vision of people eating healthfully. And then finally, the, uh, the, food, the food action team morphed into a group, the South Sound Food System Network. There was three food groups all having the same kind of meetings around uh, the county, so they merged. It was the Asset Building Coalition Food Hub, the Food um, Food Action Team, and the Thurston S Thurston System Food Council. Yeah, so now we are the the South Sound Food System Network, and we have a local culture local food culture campaign that's leading to a food summit this fall. And we've developed 11 messages, and one of those is uh, everybody everyone deserves to eat well. So obviously. Breakfast is a very important uh, component to that. And you'll see the food summit is October 20th and 21st, and there will be more information about that later. So I am going to turn it over to Chris to talk about kids getting to school safely, and I can answer questions after him if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. 
So a uh, final part of this presentation is about physical activity at school and really on the way to school uh, because every one of those trips that kids and families are making to school starting in about a month uh, is an opportunity to be physically active. Uh, whether they're taking a, a walk to school or rolling to school on a bike or uh, roller skates or a skateboard or scooter or even taking a bus, they're having an opportunity to walk from that bus stop and that's a, a chance for some physical activity, also some positive social interaction with, with peers or with uh, family members. And so we wanted to throw out there some of the safety tips about uh, that walk to school time or that uh, getting to school time. Uh, one of which is to always try to go in a group of people. Um, this, this is kind of a safety in numbers thing where you make yourself more visible uh, by being in a group and therefore more less likely to uh, have a negative encounter, a collision. Um, so there's some traffic safety that goes along with that. Um, part of that too is making yourself visible by wearing bright, brightly colored clothing. Uh, so that's a very simple thing that kids and families can do. Um, whether it's the rain jacket or putting some reflective material on a backpack, uh, there are some options there for wearing something that's bright. And then, as always, uh, trying to model the, the safe behavior as part of that trip to school. If you're a, a parent or guardian uh, or a professional that's working with the school, um, you can show kids how to be safe on their way to school, which means paying attention to your surroundings, uh, taking that moment to scan when you're at, a, at an intersection uh, to look left, then right, then left again uh, before crossing a street. Uh, those are some simple things that kids and families can do to stay safe on the way to school if you're out walking or bicycling. Now, if you're driving, uh, same thing applies in terms of attentiveness and following the rules of the road and modeling good, good behavior. Um, and there's a new law, as you know of, uh, in Washington State here now on distracted driving, uh, which means to not have those portable electronic devices uh, in your hand or within reach even uh, while you're driving around in our communities because that's going to uh, help you to keep your attention on where it belongs, which is on the roadway around you uh, and, and the surroundings and other potential uh, users of the roadway. Uh, so that's a really important point, but also just slowing down when uh, traveling through a school zone in particular. That's a 20 mile per hour speed limit. And of course, penalties go with go exceeding that, but you're also putting more at risk than your, your pocketbook when you travel fast through a school zone. So s take it easy, slow down through the school zones. Um, hopefully we get into a pattern of, of being really safe uh, around schools uh, to help kids and families make it to school safely. Uh, I wanted to share also that this is a part of the community design strategy in Thurston Thrives. Uh, so another effort to try to improve conditions in our community uh, is around making that environment really supportive of, of kids and families being able to be active. Um, and being active on the way to school is one of those things. So encouraging active transportation to school and looking at the conditions around those schools so that we can make them even more safe, uh, better crossings, better markings, um, helping guide people towards the safer, slower uh, travel through those school zones and, and guide kids and families to the right place to cross, the well-lit places to walk, those sorts of things are what we try to work on in uh, Safe Routes to School projects. And that leads to more opportunities for kids to be active and families to be active. Uh, so we're creating those abundant, safe, and convenient uh, places to be physically active around Thurston County. And I just wanted to let you know again that, uh, and I know you've heard from me about Safe Routes to School previously, but we have some great projects coming up uh, in the coming school year where we'll be working with some new school districts. We started building some relationships with Tenino and Rainier in this last uh, school year, and we intend to continue those efforts. Um, we will also continue to support some efforts at North Thurston Public Schools. Uh, we had a project with uh, Ililia Hawk over the last several years that's going to culminate uh, in and some improvements at the entrance to that school with new sidewalk and traffic calming uh, at the entrance to Lydia Hawk on Fifth Avenue uh, over in Tanglewild. And we just were awarded another grant to work on Safe Routes to School with a school that we had partnered with on Walk to School Day a couple of years back that Commissioner Blake participated in. That's Olympic View Elementary. And that neighborhood, Thompson Place, is excited about uh, the opportunity to make some improvements similar to what we've been doing with Lydia Hawk 
in their neighborhood. So those are some things to look forward to and um, we'll continue to work on reaching out to schools and involving them in efforts to increase that active transportation to school. And with that, uh, that's the conclusion, and we're available to, to answer questions that you might have, either Dr. Wood, myself, or Leslie, um, with anything that you might want to ask. How many miles do you put on your bicycle every year? Um, I, I put on about three to 4,000 miles on my bicycle on an average year. And I like to get that out, because here is a man that talks the talk, and believes in what he's talking about. So, uh, Chris, I think you're a real inspiration. And when you talk about health, I think people listen. And safety as well. But. I, I hope I model the good, safe riding and driving behaviors myself when I'm out in the community. I'm not just a cyclist. I'm also a <laughs> pedestrian a lot of the time and a, and a motorist sometimes too. And so that, those, those are all uh, areas where we need to work to to be safe. Uh, the county's got some good programs going on to address traffic and road safety. There was a workshop last week that uh, is going to put together a new, a new strategic effort on that aspect because that is a, a leading contributor to deaths in our community, fatalities on, on the roads, and uh, it is something we need to continue to focus on and work on alongside promoting the physically active ways of, of getting around. Well, thank you for setting the example. You're welcome. I have questions for all three. Okay. Should I just jump in? Yep, do it. Well, it's not so much a question. First, I'll start with, with you, Chris. Okay. I love that you put on there that uh, uh, safety, in, uh, safety in numbers and uh, safety and strength in numbers because kids are less likely to be victimized but also less likely to get talked into doing something they really ought not be doing if they're hanging out with good kids, you know, with their friends. Mm -hmm. um, and bright colors uh, when they're walking and or biking especially now we're waking up and it's a little bit darker in the morning now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And we're heading into the, uh, darker of course, months 51 of the year. or 52 days without rain, measurable rain at the airport in SeaTac anyway, but that will change. Uh, the, the, the inclement weather's coming. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Wood, the, uh, with the, all the vaccines and vaccinations uh, with the kids, boys and girls, is HPV virus vaccine, is that uh, also offered? That will be offered tonight at the back to school clinic. Uh, it is not a required, it's a recommended. Correct. And it, you have to be a certain age to get, start, get started on that, but thank you for asking. Uh, there's been some changes with the vaccine. It's now offered as young as nine years of age. And actually, if you get that vaccination before age 15, you only need two. Uh, in the series, it's a two dose series. If you don't start till age 15, it's a three dose series. So thanks for asking. And that prevents or preventative uh, cancer, head and neck cancers. Uh, it's no, it it's um, cervical cancer, anal genital cancers, uh, uh, and uh, genital warts. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then uh, Leslie, thank you very much for accompanying me on the farmers market. Uh, we had a nice chat at farmers market. Yeah. Uh, and thank you also for saying that breakfasts don't have to be conventional because I eat very unconventional breakfast. And I'm going to take that home and tell my wife All right. <laughs> as well. Uh, and is, are there any federal or state threats to, uh, uh, to our, our funding for, uh, for foods for the kids? For... What? That's one of my questions. Okay. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure about funding. I know that um, recently they have been, they've made some of the, the requirements that I showed you a little bit more flexible, uh, mostly with the grains and the uh, the grains and the um, sodium. But I know the farm bill is is a big one that includes the USDA, you know, lunch breakfast and lunch program. So it's possible that it could be, you know, okay. less funding than usual. And I'm sure SPI Chris Reichdahl mm -hmm. will do everything he can to fight fight for funding. And finally, you were going through the uh, grains and protein and dairy and such. Uh, is marshmallow cream a dairy product? <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me yes. It's an it's a extra that we sh should consume in moderation. Pardon me? An extra that That's we should consume in moderation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for all that you do as well. well don't walk away. I got a question. 
Um, so similar to what he was talking about as far as a threat, but I was kind of looking more of a local as far as uh, nutrition for the kids. Is there one area in your expertise that we could do better in or, or where we can best put money, people, and efforts to help out with nutrition and foods for the kids, just off the top of your head? Um, continue supporting WIC, continue oh. supporting, you know, healthy foods in, in preschool, um, schools, um, boys and girls clubs, just... Yeah, kids are uh, kids are a future, so we definitely oh, need. Cool. I like that. Yep. Let's do that. <laughs> I think the doctor wants to add in. And I would just say uh, that when you eat, you eat mindfully and don't eat in front of the television. Huh? Yeah, what? That's good advice. <laughs> I won't tell my wife that part. <laughs> okay, the computer then. <laughs> okay, uh, anything else? No. No? Anything else? I'm just so proud of all the work you've all done. Yeah, thank you so thank much you. for... Um, the information and presentation we have here. All right, we're gonna move on to the next item on the agenda. And I think we're gonna have uh, investigations and controlled disease program overview by Jeannie Knight and John App. <laughs> I'll let you come say it. <laughs> Epidemiologist, I got that. Come on up, John, yeah. Aplanolp. There we go. Aplanolp. There we go. I tried. Say it again, please. Aplanolp. There we go. Good afternoon, Commissioners Blake, Hutchings, and Edwards. Um, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to provide you with an update of the Investigation and Control of Disease Program. Um, as we've said, John is here to give the majority of this presentation, but some of the, th I will introduce him by saying that the staff in this program work very closely with our health officer, Dr. Rachel Wood, and the staff for the program include John Aplanelp, our senior epidemiologist, three community health nurses, Marianne Ramey and Deb Ward in a vacant position that is currently in recruitment, and Fung Nguyen, who works as our program assistant. The staff in this program are responsible for surveillance, investigation, follow-up, prevention, and intervention activities for notifiable conditions, outbreaks, emerging illnesses, and other communicable diseases reported to our department by our community partners who in, are mandated by law and rule to report to us and include organizations like labs, healthcare providers, hospitals, veterinarians, schools, child care providers, and the public. I'm gonna turn this over to John, who's gonna to talk to you specifically about program and some of the specific program areas like tuberculosis and the vaccine program that, the, that they are responsible for. And then I'll take a minute during the middle of this presentation to update you about syringe exchange activities which connect with the investigation and control of disease program in that it is a program that is found effective in reducing disease transmission like hepatitis B and C and HIV. So John, it's all yours. And again, thanks for having us this afternoon to talk to you about our program. Uh, my name is John Oplanol, but I'm the senior epidemiologist at Thurston County Public Health. And Jeannie actually worked through quite a few slides, so we're already on slide number four. And just to start out, this slide just gives you some context. <coughs> Wanted to talk to you about, I'm sure everyone's aware <coughs> diseases are bad. We generally want to avoid them. But to give you some historical context of why we want to do that, this slide, which is courtesy of uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, just shows that over the last 100 years, we've really had in public health some great success in the area of infectious disease control and prevention. So the slide shows that back in 1900, for every 100,000 people in the US, about 800 of them died from an infectious disease, and about 900 <coughs> of them died from a non-infectious condition. So over the course of time, you can see that that orange line representing infectious disease has gone down significantly. Um, it, it, like I said, it's been one of the great successes of public health, so that's been due to vaccines, that's been due to antibiotics, but that's also been due to public health activities in investigating diseases, understanding their transmission, and halting their spread. 
So just in short, if you don't take anything else away from this, focusing on infectious disease does work in, uh, prevent, in saving lives. So as you can also see on the graph, in about 1918, there's a big spike up. And that was a worldwide flu pandemic. And that's just a reminder that you know, we need to be vigilant. The, these new diseases are being discovered all the time. In just the last couple of years, we've had a resurgence of Ebola, including cases in the US. We've had Zika virus. In the not so distant past, we've had West Nile. And there's always the risk of a flu pandemic popping up pretty much anywhere in the world now. So again, as Jeannie said, our mission is to prevent and control the spread and severity of disease outbreaks. So that's our goal. And we have the activities that we uh, undertake to do that can be kind of broken down into five different categories. The first one is that we're just monitoring. We're on the lookout. We're always looking out for new diseases, unusual things that maybe we haven't seen before, but also just kind of our bread and butter daily diseases that we know we're going to experience. After that, of course, uh, once we become aware of a disease, we're going to go investigate it. And at that point, we're always reliant on partners. So we're working really closely with healthcare providers, with schools, as Jeannie said, veterinarians, uh, just a broad array of community partners to gather the information that we need to do the next part, which is assess. Our, our goal really is to assess and understand, is this a public health concern? There are a lot of diseases that we're investigating that we can work to manage and keep them from being a public health concern. But until we do an investigation and do that assessment, we don't know. And that assessment really is something unique to public health. Healthcare providers are gonna assess their patient. We're assessing things like how many people could that patient have exposed and how can we prevent the spread. So after the assessment's done, and again, an important part for governmental public health is that we're gonna educate. So we educate occasionally the patient. So we're, again, our focus with educating a patient is to make sure that they're not spreading the disease. We educate healthcare providers. We educate uh, schools to stop transmission. There, there are a lot of different uh, venues where transmission can happen that we're really working to prevent. Uh, the final uh, activity that we have up there is to guide, and this is something that we do with healthcare providers, and this is an important role for public health because, like I said, we are really on the lookout for new diseases, so diseases that healthcare providers may never have seen before and may not be aware of. So we have a really significant role in keeping up to date so that we can uh, guide them in their diagnosis and in testing. And it's also important not just for new diseases, but also older diseases that are reemerging. So measles, we have a lot of healthcare providers in the community who've never seen a measles case because the vaccine has been so effective that younger doctors may have never seen a case. So public health remains an important repository of knowledge to help them do a better, have a better understanding of what the disease looks like to aid their diagnosis. So I talked a little bit about our relationship with healthcare providers, but this slide was just kind of to bring it home that uh, disease prevention is always a team effort. And we're an important part of that team, but we're only one part. Uh, the other important players would always be the public, but also healthcare providers. So the ways that we work, we're really focused on the, the health of the community as a whole. And as I've said, we're interested in looking upstream and looking big picture. Where are people getting infected? What kinds of patterns of disease are we seeing? A healthcare provider, on the other hand, is really focused on their patient, and that's the way it should be. They shouldn't be necessarily worried about the health of the entire community. They have their hands full with their patient that they need to work on. So we need to work together with them, but our role is separate and important. So having said that you know, we don't do patient care, I did just want to mention tuberculosis because it's a very specific uh, case. It's mentioned in, uh, it's a very popular disease. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, because of its history, it's mentioned in state code. And the county government is actually obligated in a way that it's not for other diseases. And so we did want to just give you all a heads up that 
um, according to the Washington Administrative Code, the county is a payer of last resort in, for tuberculosis, uh, meaning that if we have a person who, without health insurance who has an active case of tuberculosis, we are on the hook for taking care of them. And that, again, is very different from other diseases. Other diseases are managed by uh, other healthcare providers, but in the case of tuberculosis, our health officer becomes the doctor basically in charge of their tuberculosis diagnosis and management. So that's a little bit different, and it does open up the county to sig the possibility of significant financial obligation. Uh, there are, we're able to acquire the medications that are required for treatment of tuberculosis, but only the frontline treatments at no charge. There are uh, multiple drug resistant strains of tuberculosis that are common in other parts of the world and that are occasionally seen here that would require a very different set of medications and can rack up bills uh, for the county into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And some other counties in the state have seen cases like that and have incurred pretty significant costs. And the next program that I wanted to just call out briefly was our vaccine program. Uh, Dr. Wood did a great job of talking to you all about uh, uh, the importance of vaccinations. Just wanted to let you know that currently we, as the health department, are really involved in assuring vaccine safety, ensuring that our providers are managing the vaccine and administering vaccines appropriately. Um, the work that we are doing is being restructured by the state. So the State Department of Health is restructuring all of this work statewide. It's going to be regionalized starting in the middle of next year. So at that point, there will be some of the work that we're currently doing will move to the State Department of Health. Some of it will remain in our region, which for the sake of this program is our, uh, is the Cas uh, Cascade. Pacific Action Alliance, yes. <laughs> so one county in, in our, uh, in the CPAA will be taking on some of these tasks and administering them for the entire region. And now I'll turn it over to Jeannie to give you an update on the syringe exchange program. In respect of for time, I know there are other reports that need to happen this afternoon. I'm probably going to abbreviate this. Um, what you can see from the graph that we have up on the screen is that it's been a busy year at the syringe exchange. Each of the points that you see represents syringes exchanged for the week. The dotted line is a trend line that tells us that exchanges are increasing over time. I'm pleased to share with you that we have hired two staff to work in the syringe exchange program. Lori McWilliams comes to us from our developmental disabilities program and Patrick Judkins comes from an external agency. They both bring an incredible amount of passion to this work and have an incredible amount of experience working with vulnerable populations. They will be a wonderful addition to the Disease Control and Prevention Division. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of how we got to the syringe exchange. Um, syringe exchanges were authorized by the state in 1988. In 1993, Thurston County piloted, and our then health officer piloted a syringe exchange program which was authorized by the board of our county board of health and it's operated continuously since then. Um, syringe exchange programs have been found to be effective in reducing disease transmission and promoting drug treatment. We continue to operate a fixed syringe exchange site at 1000 Cherry Street in Olympia on Tuesdays and Thursdays from noon until 4.45 p.m. The exchange provides for a one-to-one -one exchange with a maximum set by, policy, by our department's policy. And what that means is that for every syringe that a person brings in, we exchange it for another syringe. We provide educational and harm reduction materials like condoms and alcohol wipes in addition to the syringes. We provide for the safe disposal of more needles than we exchange in a year. 
we provide a unique point of access to a very hard to reach population which we use as an opportunity to actually engage them in conversations about some of the resources and treatment that is available. We serve a continuum of the population that is likely not who many in this community believe the typical person who injects drugs is. We collaborate with a lot of community partners to offer support services and facilitate treatment referrals. We're co-housed with Capital Recovery Center and work collaboratively with their programs and staff. No drug dealing or use is allowed on the property. Our new staff is gearing up to get the mobile exchange up and operating again and to expand services to include HIV, counseling, testing, and referral, and also to look at expanding services to include hepatitis C, counseling, testing, and referral. Since January, we've had 1,226 client visits to the exchange, which represents 580 unduplicated clients. 204 of those individuals have visited the exchange on multiple occasions. We've exchanged over 635,000 syringes. We exchange an average of 10,400 syringes per each day of operation. How many again, Jeannie? 10,400. Each day? Each day of operation. And you do it two days a week. And we do it two days a week, and that uh, is the equivalent of about 20,500 syringes per week. 66% of those exchanging give a Thurston County zip code as their place of residence. 31% provide a zip code from within this region. Males account for 57% of those exchanging. Um, the age range with the highest percent of exchangers is that 30 to 39 years of age at 38% followed by those under the age of 30 at 26%. The main drug that those individuals who use the exchange indicate they're using is heroin at 50%, followed by methamphetamine at 34%, and a combination of drugs at 14%. Um, I have a packet of information that I'm going to leave with you um, to review. And I want you to know that we would gladly come back later to talk with you more about the exchange. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about it. Now I'm going to turn it back over to John. And we just wanted to wrap up with a little bit more information and just look at, uh, on the communicable disease side, what we were investigating in 2016. So just really quick in review, uh, we can see that in 2016, our number of cases was 43% above uh, baseline, if you look, that was established from 2008 to 2014. So we're seeing a significant increase in cases. And looking at the distribution of those cases, the majority are sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, next highest group is hepatitis. So we are really excited to have some great staff on board for the syringe exchange because that's been proven to be a great way to prevent hepatitis C transmission especially. So we're excited to see those rates hopefully at least stabilize, but they are still increasing currently. So the hepatitis and uh, sexually transmitted diseases are really driving the overall increase in diseases that we're seeing. But that's not to shortchange the other diseases. We don't want to you know, give them short shrift because a lot of the other diseases up there, the vaccine preventable and vector borne diseases, take up a tremendous amount of staff time because they can typically be really contagious diseases that uh, have the ability to spread through a population very quickly. Or they are, as with uh, Ebola and Zika, they're new and unusual diseases. So again, we're providing a resource, but it's taking a lot of staff time to work with all the partners in the community that need to be engaged in this work. And that is the end of our presentation. We just have a list of our all the staff involved that Jeannie mentioned earlier. So any questions? All right. You have a question, comment, anything? Yeah. Fresh. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, up at the jail, like for uh, tuberculosis, 
how many people can be up there, or maybe are up there, that are, don't they have to be in a pressurized outside venting cell? If they were suspected of having tuberculosis, they should be in a negative pressure. Ne yeah, I guess negative yeah. pressure, as you call it. But I don't know how many I don't know what, okay. they have the capacity for up there. And I would just say, um, people will say I have TB, but they could have just the infection which is different from the disease. If you have the infection, you uh, are not contagious. You just, the organism is in your body, but you're not uh, spewing it out when you talk or sing or cough. If you get the disease, your immune system is losing in the fight against the tuberculosis, mycobacteria, and then you can com become contagious. And that's where public health gets involved because our job is to protect the public's health. Anything else? I would, I would imagine that epidemiology and sociology are closely related uh, when you're looking at infectious diseases and such. And so when I look at your first chart from the CDC, uh, it shows infectious diseases, disease causes are, are pretty flat yeah, line. One, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Very flat line. And I would have expected it uh, to bubble up here and there, but it hasn't. But then when I look at your most recent uh, chart, that you're, the one that's on the screen now, spikes considerably in uh, 2014. And so my, my question is, is that, uh, and this, I have a question for you too, Jeannie, but is that uh, due to the antivirus campaigns or is that due to we stopped the mobile exchange and have we started the mobile exchange already again yet? So oh, is we, that where you're going? Yes. So <laughs> well, one of the differences is that this slide is looking at deaths, so death rate due to disease, oh, whereas the, uh, okay. the other slide was just Thurston County cases of disease. Okay. So they're okay. just reported cases, not, not deaths. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the significance there could be that we're better at controlling uh, diseases now so that they're less likely to lead to a death, which so is why on this line you're seeing it relatively flat. Okay. So the 43% spike, is that... Is that, uh, can you put your finger on why it's spiking? Like I said, it, a lot of it's driven by an increase in sexually transmitted diseases and an increase in the diagnosis of hepatitis C. With hepatitis C, it has a long latency That's the majority period. of the cases then, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's not because of the anti-vaccine with the kids and such and, uh, and or other campaigns where the measles, like that's infectious, those types of things. They're not driving, that is definitely a concern, but we aren't seeing that drive any numbers yet. Although with one good outbreak, we could see that happen in this county. It's a great question, but I agree with what John's saying right now. If that's not contributing to this pie graph, it would be, as you see, it would be the salmon colored um, vaccine preventable um, slice of the pie, which is uh -huh. rel relatively small. Okay, and that's where I'm looking at the sociology, that and the needle exchange and such. Um, but uh, do we have, did you see a spike in any of these diseases when uh, we stopped the mobile needle exchange, Jeannie? Um, I don't think that any of the spikes that we're seeing are associated with that. Um, do know that what we do know is that the fastest growing um, population where we're seeing an increase in hepatitis C cases, in particular acute hepatitis C cases, is in the young drug using population. Okay. And oftentimes, because it's a pretty insidious disease, we don't, people do not even recognize that they have the acute illness. So it's not until they're diagnosed later that we even um, are talking to them about it. Okay. And we haven't started the mobile needle exchange back up yet? No, not We're yet. We're working on it. You're working on it. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I want to stay on the mobile exchange, exchange team. Uh, can you kind of give me an idea of how it works or the concept of it? Uh, and then I have a question about the chart. Is it related to And you'll to have it? to come to the microphone, Jeannie. Yeah. Um, so people can hear. Well, let me say that in the past, our mobile unit worked by people calling into the staff person and the staff person made arrangements to meet them in um, 
sometimes precarious locations. What we've talked about doing this time is finding some semi um, fixed locations where we actually can let the public know where we're going to be or let our let those folks that use the exchange know where we're going to be on a regular basis so they have access. Uh, what we're, we've talked about is looking at areas of the county where we know we've got folks that are having difficulty accessing our fixed sites, so likely it'll be places like Rochester, Yelm, someplace out toward um, the Summit Lake area. And what we're going to do is find, and we've been out driving around looking, but we're going to try to find some fixed sites that are relatively safe for uh, the staff because we don't want to put them at risk being in the back hills and we want them to be in contact with our office. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and what it would be is we would indicate what our hours of operation are and we would be there to meet people at that site. Okay, so on your syringe exchange program chart, does that uh -huh. represent, I'm, I'm thinking geographically, I'm a map dude, so I gotta think, is that all Olympia and then mobile teens are out in the um, rural the, area? Is that kind of how the concept works? What this represents is everything that we have taken in since January 1st of 2017. So each point that you see on the graph mm -hmm. represents how many syringes we took in on a weekly basis. Right. I certainly can, um, and information I have for you will break it down okay. a little bit further so that you know which okay. areas we're seeing. So this seeing is everything them. as we know it, but still we have to incorporate the, uh, the unanticipated mobile crisis, not mobile crisis, mobile exchange team. Yeah, and what we don't know and probably will not know until we have that up and running is if it is going to mean we see those peaks and valleys be much more than they are right now because we're moving out into areas where people may not be accessing anything. Mm -hmm. We really don't know until we get it up and running what kind of an impact there will be. Sure, thanks. And did you, by Dr. Wood, did you have a thing on tuberculosis you were going to mention? I saw you when he was mentioning you. Uh, I caught, caught you off guard, didn't I? You hmm. did. I'll, I'll go okay. back through we'll my memory banks. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, sure. Uh, any other questions for nope. Jeannie and John? No? Thank you. You remember now? Yeah. Uh, the CDC um, has a nice um, one page, what they call infographic on the costs of tuberculosis, <coughs> just very in general. But if you have uh, uh, just an ordinary case that's susceptible to all four first line drugs, that can cost uh, somewhere between 50000 and up, but mm. usually around 50000 if you have a multiple drug resistant case, that involves staff visiting the home twice a day to inject anti-TB drugs. It can cost roughly $150,000. Oh my word. Mm -hmm. So that, I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are a lot of different variables and I'm happy to talk about that more. Jeannie and John, thank you so much thank for what you, you do. The county and people in county is very, very important. Okay, mm -hmm. okay good. Nighttime reading. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's I'm almost nighttime. Okay. Thanks, Jeannie. Thank you. Okay. thank you, ma'am. So the next item we have on our agenda is number seven. It's the director's report, and Director of Public Health and Social Services, Shelley Slaughter, is going to tell us what's going on. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, I want to say thank you, first of all, to all our presenters and guests today, and the staff, as always, does a, just a superb job. So thank you so much for all that great information that you shared with us. Um, I hope that the families in our community will take advantage of those immunization clinics uh, that were mentioned earlier in the presentation, as well as the Little Red Schoolhouse event, which provides free back-to-school supplies and community resources will be taking place at Kamachan Middle School on August 17th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So as you heard from the presenters today, it's really important that kids are healthy, safe, and ready to learn when the school year starts. But we know that learning does not begin in kindergarten. 
children's very earliest experiences beginning at birth impact their developing brains and form the foundation for their futures. Unfortunately, fewer than 50% of kids in Thurston County are not ready to start kindergarten, ready to learn. So by 2020, the State Department of Early Learning seeks to increase this figure to 90%. So we have a lot of work to do. Research shows that high quality early learning programs increase graduation rates by up to 44% and yield between four and nine dollars for every dollar that we invest in our community. Children who participate in these programs have better math and reading skills, higher earnings in adulthood, improved family stability, fewer teen pregnancies, and are less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. So tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. at the Hotel RL, the Thurston County Chamber Forum, sponsored by Thurston Thrives, will feature a local panel of experts about high quality early learning, about how high quality early learning positively impacts children and families here in our community. And that will be facilitated by our own Liz Davis, Thurston Thrives coordinator. So we're really looking forward to that and hope that you and others in our community can attend. So speaking of healthy early starts, we just finished up World Breastfeeding Week. It was held August 1st through 7th. Yesterday, the Birth House, a local birthing center, was awarded the Gold Award from the Washington State Department of Health for their excellence in promoting breastfeeding practices and improving the health of mother and babies. They join bronze winners, which you recognized previously, Capital Medical Center and Providence St. Peter Hospital. At our department, we continue to be focused on increasing the initiation and duration of breastfeeding through programs such as our Nurse Family Partnership Program and through our participation in the South Sound Breastfeeding Network. Among the known health benefits of breastfeeding are nutritionally balanced meals, some protection against common childhood infections, and better survival during a baby's first year, including a lower risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Research also shows that very early skin-to-skin -skin contact and suckling has physical and emotional benefits that um, stay with the child for life. Other studies suggest that breastfeeding may reduce the risk of certain allergies, reduces asthma, obesity, and type 2 di diabetes. It also may help improve an infant's, an infant's cognitive development. Worldwide, with increased breastfeeding, 823,000 infant deaths and maternal deaths could be prevented. So we at the Thurston County Health and Social Services Department joined the American Academy of Pediatrics and the World Health Organization in encouraging mothers to nurse their babies exclusively for the first six months and continue breastfeeding along with safe, healthy, solid foods to two years or beyond and congratulate all the mothers for their breastfeeding efforts and everyone in our community who supports nursing moms and babies. In other good prevention news, last month we provided training to local youth serving organizations on vape kits. So knowledge about impacts, particularly poisoning from vaping and vapor products can be more easily shared. This is part of the new comprehensive tobacco and vapor product prevention project for which our department is the lead on in the Cascade Pacific Action Alliance seven county region. We'd also like to remind the community that we have a Take Back Your Meds program, which includes six local Dropbox locations throughout Thurston County for safely and securely disposing of unused or unwanted medications. Unwanted and unused prescription medications are a major problem. They can pose health risks as a result of accidental poisonings or intentional misuse, as well as environmental risks if they make their way into sewers and septic tanks. We're especially concerned with keeping medications away from young children and preventing opioid overdoses. Often people are prescribed more prescription pain medication than they need and people leave that extra medication in their cabinet. This is often a source for young people and can lead to serious opioid addiction and overdoses. Dr. Wood and I are participating in a regional opioid response group and will be launching a task force in Thurston County to develop a plan to prevent opioid overdoses in our community. We're pleased in environmental news that ongoing weekly Summit Lake water quality testing indicates no dangerous levels of toxic algae. Other lakes in Thurston County are also testing below levels of concern for toxic algae. Summer is a very busy time for our food safety team as they work to prevent foodborne illnesses throughout, th through education and inspection at the many local fairs and festivals and food new food establishments. And from a health perspective, the Thurston County Fair was a huge success, and we're glad that despite the high heat and poor air quality uh, due to the fires from British Columbia that there were no reported health emergencies. 
the Board of County Commissioners, thank you very much, just recently provided over $4 million in funding administered by my department to support 25 local homeless and affordable housing programs throughout Thurston County. How much, I'm sorry? $4 million. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> These programs provide shelter, affordable housing, rental assistance, homeless prevention, and supportive services to vulnerable homeless and low-income families with children, youth, domestic violence victims, individuals with disabilities, and single adults. We're also pleased to announce that the Washington State Department of Commerce recently awarded us an additional $93,000 in funds uh, to support uh, additional programs. The Thurston Thrives Housing Action Team and Homeless Housing Hub have recommended a five-year homeless housing plan to the county. Staff are currently reviewing the plan and giving other local governments and community stakeholders an opportunity to provide input before submitting to the commissioners for approval. We'll be convening a cold weather task force as well, along with other local government partners and community providers to plan for the upcoming cold weather season and ensure that no one is left out on our streets in the cold this winter. And that's all I have. Tom has a question. <laughs> no, not gonna go there. No, I'm good. Okay. No, sir. Nothing. Uh, didn't catch who got the gold star for? That's the birth house, a local birthing center. Who? The birth house. Oh, the birth house, okay. So have we had the bronze star in there, right? That was okay, good. Uh, okay, Dr. Wood. Thank you. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Katie Glasser, who's a fourth year medical student at Pacific Northwest University of the Health Sciences. Come on up. Dad, <laughs> Come on up, yeah, she's, she's seeing what we do in public health. And so, yeah. <laughs> Hello, no, and I wanted to just let you know what um, my amazing colleagues at the health department, thank you, Katie, yeah. thanks for your interest, and thank you for being a future physician welcome. In, um, welcome. in America. Um, I wanted to just let you know that staff have arranged for her to experience uh, the Medical Reserve Corps Back to School Immunization immunization clinic with me tonight, um, an afternoon at the syringe exchange, home visits to NFP clients, nurse family partnership clients with mm -hmm. the nurses, restaurants and inspections with environmental health staff, and home visits to CTV patients. That's with all me. tonight? No, no, no. <laughs> Just, we, I get her for a week and um, we're, we're having fun. Um, sure. I, I, my efforts are continually to uh, educate my clinical colleagues about all the um, partnerships that we have with them. Um, and then I just wanted to give an example of a, of a contact investigation. Uh, John and Jeannie talked to you about our infection and control, uh, control of communicable disease staff. So there was a, uh, a young person between the ages of five of 10 who had a positive pertussis uh, test. Um, our, our nursing staff investigating who she may have had contact with while she was infectious, realized that uh, one of her parents actually ran a daycare, and there were 12 kids at the daycare. Um, the, a step-parent had um, uh, where this uh, child spent some of her time um, had just given birth to an infant, um, and so you know, there's a lot of work to be done in protecting uh, families and, and contacts from communicable diseases. So thank you for that opportunity. And okay. finally, um, emergency preparedness never stops. Um, we have a pharmacy memorandum of understanding uh, signed for Thurston County, and we just also, thanks to the attorneys in five counties in the area, um, are moving forward on mutual aid agreement with the tribes. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic, wonderful. Great. Any questions for Dr. Wood? Thank Comments? you. Yes, sir. No? Okay. Anything else from Romero? Anybody? Anybody else? We're good? Oh. Oh. I knew just, that. Just actually, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues at the County Department of Emergency Management are uh, plugging this, but there's an upcoming series of National Preparedness Month coming up in September. There will be some brown bag luncheons uh, with excellent topics for preparing for uh, <coughs> disasters. Thank you. You bet. All righty. I want to thank everybody for your hospitality, your professionalism, your expert. Keep up the good work. Take care of each other out there. And is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn the Board of Health meeting of August 8th, 2019.
2017. Second. It's been moved and second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.